All right. So if you've been on any of these calls before or you're part of our program or you read the book, you understand that a big part of our overall investing strategy is using S&P ETFs. So I always like to do a check-in on the S&P market. Um, we're looking, we're sitting at 41.38. One of the things that I was looking at is the year to date, we're up 6%. That sounds awesome. Over the last 12 months, we're down 7%. That also sounds awesome because if we continue to dollar cost average, um, we talked about this last week, we are at the fourth peak over the last 12 months. Uh, that shows us that there have been previous peaks with upside, but there also shows us that there's been a lot of downside over the last 12 months. Dollar cost averaging, those monthly contributions into each of our accounts are going to help us build wealth over time. This isn't my strategy, and I'm not even going to say that it is Warren Buffett's strategy, but he's definitely made compound interest and dollar cost averaging famous through the use of index funds. It simplifies investing, and it gives you an opportunity to build wealth. The biggest thing that I'm looking at right now in the markets, um, as I talk to fund managers and I talk with other investors and I talk with you, the parents and the members of our community, there's a growing concern around credit availability. Now this has a couple tangents to it. One is the tightening of the credit markets after a lot of the recent bank collapses as they look to solidify their books, um, they look to offload a lot of unproductive bond purchases or treasury purchases that are below inflation, which technically means that they've committed capital to a long-term investment that is not going to pay enough in returns to overcome current inflationary forces. So that basically means they're losing money and banks don't survive when they lose money. That restructuring... Um, Technically, it hasn't happened yet at a lot of the major banks, and that creates growing credit concerns. It's harder to get credit today. Um, the second reason for that is interest rates are higher. And when interest rates are higher, there's less um, desire to borrow without um, an intrinsic need. Um, when we think about buying real estate, which is a big part of our portfolio, the rates are up. 250% from where they were two or three years ago. We talked last week about how, although that creates a higher payment, for the first time, the median price of a home it dropped for, I think, the first time in 13 years because of these pressures. Now, the housing market had gotten out of hand, so that's not necessarily a terrible thing, um, but it's a conundrum for investors and for people that are looking to buy their first home. My buddy sent me an article. Um, it's always hard. You want to call someone a douchebag, but you know they have a billion dollar fund. So you have to balance their accomplishments with their douchery. And we're talking about the one and only Grant Cardone. He did, although he addressed it in a way that I think is idiotic, he did bring up a good topic, which is something that I faced in my career. And it's something that you're going to face as you continue to build these portfolios for yourself and for your children. And it's the battle of fear when thinking about wealth. Huh. I think about how many times when I was younger, this happened when I was 28, this happened when I was 35, I'm now 44, and I'm not even going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to lie and say that it's not something that I battle with today. When your portfolios hit a certain value, and for many individuals, it's that first time it hits a million dollar mark, all of a sudden you become fearful. It's a lot of money. It's your future, it's your children's future. You start to become fearful. You start to become defensive. You start to forget that everything that you've done up to this point in order to make that money or put that money into that portfolio has worked. And you think that you need an entirely new strategy because you've got to protect that money. You can't afford to lose that money. That's the absolute worst thing that you can do. Now, I'm not talking about going off the rails um, and buy, putting all your money in Bitcoin. Um, I want to be careful because if you know me, you know a lot of my wealth was created in cryptocurrencies. But I'm 44. I'm a parent now. I've got a five-year-old. I've got a one-year-old. The dynamics of my needs have changed significantly. 
the investment strategies that I used years and years ago when I had no responsibility, of course, are different than today when I do have responsibility. But the strategies that we lay out in the book, the strategies that we lay out in the course, they are tried and true, proven strategies that help you build wealth. So as you implement them and you see your portfolio continuing to grow, understand that these are the strategies that have helped you get there and that you want to stick with your guns. There is some, honesty is the wrong word, reality is the wrong word, it's truth in what Grant Cardone was talking about in his onstage rant about how fear kills millionaires more than anything else is that you have to understand as your portfolios grow, you cannot become fearful. You have to ride the market the same way going forward that you rode it to get to the point that you're at today. The only time that changes is when you're thinking about your own personal portfolio as you start to reach the age where that portfolio is going to become the lifeblood of your income. That's typically close to retirement. A lot of people at that time move a lot of their stock market investments into guaranteed interest um, yield instruments such as annuities, treasuries, bonds, things that can give them the stability that they need to plan out the remainder of their life. But even if you do that when you're getting close to retirement age, that doesn't mean you change the strategy on your kids' portfolios. You're going to want to keep those the same because, again, why change what has worked? All right. So, Grant Cardone, thank you for a talking point, even though I think you're a douchebag. Now, I shared in the Wealth Lounge an article. I saw it on CNBC and linked back to a bank rate survey. And man, did it ever reinforce what we talk about in this group. And what it was is it's, it was talking about that 68% of parents say that they've overextended themselves to help their children financially. Why is this such a big deal? In today's world, if you're 20 something or 30 something, the world is much different than when your parents were that age. You're burdened by student loan debt. You are stuck in a cycle where you can't save enough money to buy a home. Interest rates definitely aren't helping. Homes are so much more expensive today than they were even 10 years ago. But if you flip that on its head and you're a parent now and you've got kids under the age of five, you can actually solve all of these problems for your kids before they ever even have to face them. I am faced with the conundrum of the American dream. People often say that it's dead, that there is no more middle class, that the kids today will never live a life like their parents did. And their parents today are effing struggling to live a decent life because of their student loan debt, because of the cost of a home. This is why they're relying on your parents or relying on their parents. Um, 45%, I'm going to read some of these statistics because they're huge. 45% of parents with a household income under $50,000 a year compared to 41% with over $100,000 or more a year are having to dip into their retirement savings. That's not actually a big spread, 45% versus 41%. Let's round it out and say about 42, 43% of parents are having to dive into their retirement savings. 50% um, of parents are delaying paying down debt because they need to help their children. Now, if you look at this as a generational issue, if the parents have debt, probably means there wasn't a lot of early life planning for them. They didn't learn it, so they didn't do it. Now their kids are in the same boat as them. It's become a perpetual generational problem for this family. And it's gonna continue on and on and on. A cycle of being debt ridden, unable to live through financial freedom, unable to have a comfortable retirement, and then trying so hard to support their kids where they didn't plan early enough to make this easier on everybody. Your job, your job, if you're watching this video, is to break that cycle. Start planning now for your children's need in the future. And it's going to do two things. 
One, you're not going to F up your retirement. You're going to be able to plan for yourself because you know your kids are taken care of. And two, more importantly, is it's going to break a generational cycle of being a debt-ridden um, cog in the machine. There's certain words they're going to use that I want to be careful not to use. I want to help you break that cycle. And we can do that working together. 87% of parents have dove into their retirement savings to help their children. 18% of those have significantly dove into their retirement savings. It means they're effing up their retirement in order to help their kids. Now, you know what? I would look at the fact that had I not started planning for my kids' retirement when they were just born and I had that social security number and I set up those Roth IRAs and they came to me in their moment of need in their 20s or 30s and I had to dip into my retirement, I'd probably do the same thing. But I'm planning. I'm sacrificing a little bit today for them to have a better future while also still working on my own. 49% have dipped into an emergency, their emergency savings. Now, remember, we just read a second ago, 53% of Americans say they don't have any emergency savings. So if you have no emergency savings, you can't help anybody. But then of those that do, more than half of them, or right around half of them, are using that money to help their kids. It's not an emergency savings when it becomes your kid's piggy bank. 51% are not paying down debt. 45% say they're not reaching some other financial milestone because they're giving their kids money. Read the article. It's in the Wealth Lounge. The impact that it had on me is it really reinvigorated the importance of what we are doing here. For as little as $50 a month, you could be building a multi-million dollar retirement account for your children. That's less than the cost, less than a half the cost of going out to dinner once a month, right? We can make that happen. We can find that. And then looking at like the 529 account for education, the biggest debt that kids have, the anchor in their lives, you know, sometimes that can come across as a positive. The anchor that's dragging down their ability to have a successful financially free life is student loan debt. They can't buy a home because they're with their parents and they're not getting out on their own. They're not having children. They're not getting married. It is the biggest stress on the societal fabric of this country. And yes, we can sit here and we can blame a hundred other people. The government is surely to blame for much of this stress, but you can fight the system or you can find a solution. Like fight the system a little bit. It's kind of effed up. The solution is to plan early. And when you plan early, all oh, these problems go away. All right. Roger, where do you like to open up your Roth IRA accounts? Okay. Now, um, there's a couple things to this you can go with one of the macro brokers, which is actually what I do. Um, I started out with Scott Trade years and years ago. Um, it's been acquired three times over and there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. A lot of my accounts for this, including brokerage accounts, are set up at TD Ameritrade, um, primarily because back in my trading days, I loved their thinkorswim platform. As I've adopted the mentality of using index investing, to stabilize uh, my account growth. Um, that's become less important, but TD Ameritrade is my home. Uh, they make it nice and simple to do everything. They've got decent support. Um, the reality is, is I rarely ever need it. Uh, I get my monthly statements in the mail. I can look everything up online. It's easy to make deposits. You can't really go wrong. All right. How can I start a Roth IRA for my children when they don't have earned income? You know, this was something like, I'm going to tell you two parts to this story. This was something that even I have learned more about recently. What I decided to do is I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business owner. I have a corporation, an LLC. So I'm able to, and this is the simplest thing to do. And I learned this from a friend is once a year, I use my kids in an advertisement. So then I pay them as a company for modeling. 
Now this, I mean, everything's taxed. Since my daughter was one year old, she has filed a tax return every year. We've paid taxes on her income. We've paid the tax preparation fees. She's, everything is 100% above board. Um, I don't even know if I need to do as much as we do, but I want to make sure that it's documented correctly so that I never have a problem. And it's, it's worked out well for us. Um, now, as the number of accounts have grown and the types of accounts have changed, the way that income, whether it be corporate income as compensation, typically as a 1099 employee um, or contractor to do modeling, that some of the money that we put into these accounts, not the Roth, is coming from our post-tax income, so it doesn't require the same documentation. We talk about that more in the book, and we work with you one-on-one -on -one in our course to make sure that you get all of that set up correctly. On the second side, what I've learned recently is that your you can the allowance that you pay your kids can go into their Roth IRA, and it's a question for your tax accountant on the way that you're going to account for that as earned income and the way that you're going to pay taxes on that and the way that you document how that money is used in order to grow their accounts. I am not a tax professional. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a financial planner. I am just a parent who through research and trial and error put together a system that when modeled out compared to my own efforts and my own retirement savings and own investing, is going to balloon through the use of compound interest. Thank you, um, Warren Buffett, eighth wonder of the world, not Warren Buffett, compound interest, for showing us a roadmap for how, that we can, how we can do this successfully. We talk more about this in the book and it lays out some of the strategies for how you can do this as earned income, um, but I was actually blown away. I thought that I had to have a corporation. I thought that I had to do a 1099. You talk to your tax accountants, make sure that you feel comfortable with how you're doing this, and how you're accounting for it, recording it, paying taxes and all of it, you can't go wrong. Why a Roth IRA instead of a 529? Uh, this question, I, of course, came in before they, they read the book. Um, it's not an either or, it's an and question. We're going to open up a lot of different types of accounts. And we're not going to do them because of the account type. We have aligned them with different uh, life expenses to make sure, like, think about it like this. If we go back to the article from earlier, if you're not planning when your kid is one for their first car, at some point in time, either they're going to have to take on debt to buy that vehicle, or you're going to have to dive into savings, retirement, emergency fund to help them have the money to buy that car. Most 16 year olds can't afford a car. And we talk about in the book about how you want to buy a car, like the average cost, a couple of years old, certain mileage, you want to, to last a certain number of years, typically try to get them through college. Right now, that's about $30,000, $32,000, right? If you today needed to come up with $32,000, where would you get it from? Would you have to pull it out of your brokerage account? Would you have to pull it out of your business? Would you have to pull it out of your emergency fund, your savings, your um, daily operating budget? Wherever that money has to come from, if you start planning when they're one, it's going to cost you dollars compared to thousands of dollars. It's going to eliminate the stress of having to come up with that money. It's going to eliminate the problems associated with diving into your retirement and interrupting compound interest opportunities. That's just one example of how we plan for life expenses. We don't set up accounts. And by planning for life expenses through the use of certain types of accounts, we eliminate so much stress and so many problems in our lives today and tomorrow. All right, those are the three questions that came through. If you have any questions, post them in the Wealth Lounge. Feel free to message me directly. Other than that, I appreciate you joining today or watching the recording, and we will see you next week. Thank you.